He says, Ora, please, before I fell into the mother's womb, sometimes in form of a yogi, meditator, a celibate, sometimes a king, a chhatrapati, or just a beggar, non believers die and saints live. The non believers they die, only the saints and the sages they live eternally. And with their tongue, because they drink the nectar of Ram. O oh, Master, be kind, defeated, I am at your feet, give me your love. So, this is that. We have been through so many species and now is the time when we are into human body is the time to become a devotee. <coughs> That's why I went through this first. That the, It's now the time that we become, we follow the devotional path. We follow, be, we become a true devotee. The Bhagavad Gita gives the definition Krishna has described in the, Bhagavad Gita contains 18 chapters. So Prabhupada tells in the introduction, these 18 chapters were divided into three parts. The just like a sandwich, the first six chapters are the upper crust of the sandwich, the upper layer, and the last six chapters are the lower part. And the middle part, the most juicy part of the sandwich is the middle, the filling is where. Those are the in between the six chapters. That's the most, the most juicy part is that. So the twelfth chapter comes in between. So it speaks of the devotional life, that who is a pure devotee of the Lord. So unless we follow this, we cannot say whether we are chanting 16 rounds, whether we have tilak on us, we have kantimala on our, on our neck. Still, we are not the devotee. We can be a pseudo devotee. Prabhupada has clearly mentioned that one should not be a pseudo devotee. Pseudo devotee means who is outwardly a devotee, but inwardly he doesn't have the qualities of a devotee. We got to have the qualities of a devotee to be a devotee. Just chanting the rounds, just completing them for the sake of completing. In the Nectar of Instruction, it clearly says that do not follow the rules just for the sake of following them. They should be followed for spiritual advancement. They should be followed with in us an inquisitiveness that I want to spiritually advance. So we have to follow the rules to spiritually advance. They are not binding on us. That's not a bondage. Mala is no bondage. Chanting is no bondage. Bondage is the family ties, what we spoke of. Bondage is serving the family. That's a bondage. But when we serve Krishna, the family is served automatically. You offer boga to Krishna, the prasad is automatically goes to the family. So the family is served like that. So when we serve Krishna with full vigor, with full determination, it's bound that family will be served. So here it's, Krishna says in this, verse particularly that who is very dear to me? What kind of a devotee is very dear to me? So we were talking about the first, the pseudo qualities. We should not have the pseudo qualities in us because if we remember, the Krishna killed so many demons in Vrindavan. The first demon Krishna killed in Vrindavan was Putana. Putana had come dressed up as a very beautiful woman, very, very beautiful woman and she wanted to feed Krishna. She looked like any damsel from the heavenly planets. And Yashoda was so fascinated with her. She really loved her when she saw her. It's such a beauty. And she readily handed over Krishna, baby Krishna, into her, into her lap. And Putana wanted to feed Krishna. But Putana was not that what she looked. She looked a beautiful lady, but inwardly she was a demon. So what did Krishna do with her? He killed her. She tried to feed him and he sucked the life out of her and she died. And she died and she came into her real form. She was, it says, six miles long and very ugly to look at. And she instantly, she instantly came out in, his, in her real form, her real appearance. So Krishna says, when, what did Krishna do was like he killed a Putana. Putana represents the pseudo qualities in us. It's, everybody has a putana in her and her himself. We all have putana in us, somewhere or the other, because all the demons killed by Krishna and Vrindavan, they represent our demonic qualities. That's why Krishna killed them. They are all our demonic qualities. What qualities we have in us, they are the representative forms of that. So putana was killed, that is, we have to kill the pseudo qualities in us. In the other words, when we surrender to Krishna, the first thing Krishna does in us is, if our surrender is sincere, very, very sincere, then Krishna does is, helps us, he kills the Putna in us. 
he kills the Putnainas, that the pseudo quality he takes away. He makes us what we are inside and outside one. We have to be that. If we are putting tilak, if we have like beads, we have tulsi mala in, around our neck, we have to honor that. To honor that is, that, that's what Guru Maharaj has been giving all these classes, we have been attending all of us together. That is the humility we have to bring in us. So, humility means serving each other. Serving everyone, not only the devotees, serving everybody. Each and every person we have to serve. That's why Prabhupada gave the culture of Prabhuji and Mataji. Everybody is a mother and Prabhuji. It's Prabhuji for everybody, full respect. Even to a neophyte who enters into the temple, he's Prabhuji. So that's why then we'll just see the qualities, what Krishna tells here. These qualities are for devotee. If we are lacking in any one of them, because everybody is a judge for himself, nobody should judge the other person. Because we are not authorized to judge each other. Only Krishna is authorized to judge us. And we can judge ourselves. Only we and Krishna. Krishna is the witness with us, as the form of super soul in us. He is witnessing. And we all know what we are. Nobody can hide. We cannot, we can cheat others, but we cannot cheat ourselves. So here Krishna talks about the qualities which we should have and we should let Krishna take over. We should be so sincere that, that Krishna should take over on us and kill these pseudo -ness in us, make us sincere. If he kills the putana in us, we should be happy that he has killed the putana in us. So if we surrender to Krishna, the putana, in fact, she will be killed. So here the translation provides, repeat, just listen to me, one who is not envious. So Krishna says, one who is not envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. So one has to be non-envious, one has to be free from false ego, one has to, be, has to think that he is not, not the proprietor, he is not the owner of anything. He cannot own this body itself. We cannot own this body. Right now if we have fever or we get into a small, even a little bit of paralysis attack, we cannot control the, our own actions. We lose control even on a small body part as sick. So we are not the owner of this body, we are not doer of anything. We should be free from false ego. We should serve others. We have to be servant to everybody. Because usually when we write in humility, oh yes, your servant, your humble servant, or your this. But then if anybody says, oh please, do this thing for me, serve me like this, then we say, oh, I cannot do this, I'm not your servant. And if we note that in our, always in our letters, emails to each other or somewhere, we do write, your humble servant, your this. <laughs> so this is there. This is a problem everywhere. I was in London recently and earlier they said we used to, we had such a nice culture that we used to pay obeisances to each other, say vancha kalturu. Now it, later on, after a few years, it has been only vancha. We just do and mumble, vancha is audible and the rest is all gone. We just say one chakra and everything is finished. And now he says the next is coming, we just do we. We meet us and say we, we for one <laughs> That's it. It's the modern generation who do that. So now we have to carry on the tradition. We have to carry on these qualities in us. So this is then that we have to be free from false ego. We have to serve each other. A devotee means he's serving. Serving. Dasa anudas nanaka kahata. So Nanak even says, Dasa Anudas, I am servant to the servant to the servant to the servants. So if we want to please Krishna, we have to please everybody who are serving Krishna. And everybody is trying to serve Krishna in their own way. So we have to, Guru Nanak Ji goes to the extent of saying, Meri Khalo Mojade Gursik Handande. He says, the Guru's Shishya, Gursik, everywhere the word Gursik means who is disciple to Guru. Gursik doesn't mean that he has an appearance wise, he's, he's got everything intact, a turban and a beard and a, he's got, that's a Gursik. No. Gursik means he's following the instruction of the Guru. He's a Gursik. Sikh means disciple, shishya, learner. Sikhna wala. Sikhna is Sikh. 
So a disciple who is following the Guru, a spiritual master, following the instructions of a Guru, he is a Gursik. And Krishna says himself in Bhagavad Gita in the 11th chapter, he says, there are only two people, Gurmukh and Manmukh. He says, the Manmukh are the ones who will never come to me. The 11th chapter, 55th verse, Krishna clearly says, the Manmukh have got all dirt in their mind. They are Sakam Karnis. So the Kransab even says, there are only two kinds of people, Gurmukh or Manmukh. If we are not Gurmukh, we are Manmukh. They cannot be in between anywhere. We all think, oh, we have a nice balance, you know. Some things we listen from our Guru, we follow them. Some we don't like, we don't follow. That's over. So you cannot be in a media, middle way. If you're not following the instructions of the Guru, you're totally manmukh. Simply manmukh. Even if you're not following a single instruction, a small instruction, you are a manmukh. Because you don't have faith in your Guru. So the faith in the Guru, it shows when we follow the instructions of the Guru. The faith is in Krishna reveals when we follow the instructions of Guru and Krishna. So who will reveal the instructions of Krishna to us? Only Guru can reveal the instruction, instructions of Krishna to us. Nobody else. Only Guru can do that. Nobody else has the power to do that. Nobody can do it. It's only He can reveal to us. It's only Srila Prabhupada's mercy that we are so fortunate to know about Krishna so much. Otherwise, I don't think so anybody would have been able to do so much on their own, advance so much on their own, so quickly, so nicely. It's only because of Prabhupada that we are so well-versed, have become so well-versed in the verses, in the purports, in the translations, that even if we go to some place where Karam Khandi Pandits are there, they get scared of us, they get frightened of us. They want to avoid us. They don't want to mingle with us. Because in a way they are scared. They know that what we are speaking is absolutely true, absolutely correct. So it's His mercy, even it's the mercy of Srila Prabhupada that I could, and Guru Maharaj that I could go ahead with such a book. I could never have dreamt of even writing this. I was in Vancouver and they, the radio, uh, I gave interviews last year also on the radio channels, five radio channels I gave the interviews. And this year we had the opportunity to speak on TV. They took my interview and it was like three uh, TV channels, they covered me. Two gave my, um, s that discourse, that would have been, I didn't see it. Yesterday it had to be telecasted, it must have done on ATN channel. And I was, there was a three minute, four minute interview, a news report on me. In the, one of the nice cable channels there, Channel Omni, that comes all over Canada. So I want to say that, that it's only Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj Mercy that I could speak on this. and they clearly showed my book on the TV, on the screen, that what I aim is making bridges and breaking the barriers. So everybody could see, like wearing a tilak and a neck bead, they all knew that it's from his God. So this is that we have to listen to the Guru, instructions of the Guru. So as I was saying, Gunad Devi said, Meri khalo mo jade gurse khada de. He says, Meri khalo, that take off my skin, peel off my skin and make shoes for those people who under the protection of a Guru, the shelter of a Guru, sing the glories of Hari. Those who chant the name of Hari. Take, peel my skin and make shoes for them. That's his humility. So if we don't listen to the Guru, we are not Gurmukh, we are Manmukh. Then. So Krishna says, don't be a Manmukh. Our Manmukh has no place in this world. He has no place in the upper world. He cannot reach the abode of Krishna because he is Manmukh. Those who are Gurmukh, they only can go to the heavenly abodes. They can only reach Krishna. So it's here, Krishna says clearly that who is uh, free from false ego, he is equipoised in both happiness and distress. This is very important because the previous verse to this, even Krishna has described in the twelfth verse. Yona harshati na dvaishati na shorchati na kankshati shubhashu paritiyagi bhaktamane samapriye. So in this chapter he is describing about the qualities of a devotee all the time. And he is, the last verse even he said, Yona harshati na dvaishati na shorchati na kankshati. So Yona harshati, those who don't get happy, very happy on getting small things even. The material things are all very small. So he says Yona harshati, those who don't get very elated, very happy at the things they get. You know, harshati na those who have no envy. We should not be envious to anybody. 
Envy is the poison that will not let us go to the shelter of Krishna. Envy is the the best thing in us we should inculcate to get rid of envy is forgive and forget. Always keep on forgiving and forgetting. Never just forgive and keep it on you because then you will puff off your ego. Just forgive and forget. That's what we have to do. So it says, Yuna Harshatina, Dvaishatina, Shochatina, Kangshati, no shok, no regrets. No Shochatina, Kangshati, no Akanksha, no desires at all. Krishna wants such a person that he has nothing, no desires also. Na shochati, na kaakshati, shubha, shubha parityagis. For such a person who is totally surrendered, there is no pious and no impious. Shubha, shubha parityagi. He has nothing inpo- inauspicious, not, nothing auspicious. Such a kind person, such a person who has given up auspiciousness and inauspiciousness is very dear to me, Krishna said. But you would say, what kind of a person he would be? Who can be one who is free from all these? Who can be one? Only a dead person can be one. That's right. But only if we speak in the common man's language, a person who is dead to the world only can be like this. A dead body can be like this. Because a dead body is the one, if you praise him, nothing is going to react on him. If you don't say nice words to him, if you abuse him even, he won't react to it. He has no desires. He is equipped in distress and happiness because he is dead to the world. So Krishna wants in a way, the surrend- we surrender to him, we become dead to the world. We are in the world, but we are dead to everything, all the reactions into the world. So Bhagavad Gita actually speaks of all reactions and actions and reactions. It's all that. Action and reaction. If the chain of action and reaction goes on, then the cycle of life and death would go on. So we have to break the cycle of life and death. So that breaking is not giving reactions to the... which whatever reactions we have already, we are actually reaping what now? What actions we did, we are reaping those reactions now. Sukh is the reaction of the pious activities we did. Dukh is the reaction of the impious activities we did. So if we want to break the chain, we have to break the reaction and action chain. So there is actually a small story which I would speak and then we can finish up. It says there is, uh, there is one story from the Puran as it is, that there was a king. Uh, it says a young prince, he was married off to a very young princess and he was coming from, uh, after the marriage, the procession was coming through towards their kingdom back. So they had few servants with them and it was the, the dark, the night fell on and they had wanted a place to stay on, to spend the night. So the young prince, he told his servants that you should look out for somewhere that I can stay in the night. So there was a forest ahead, but then they saw an ashram. They saw a lamp lit in an ashram. They could, see, they could see some light from there. And they go there and they see that's an ashram where one sage is there, one mahant is living there. So they asked that mahant that can our prince and the princess spend the night here? And the mahant says, of course they can. And he opened up all the rooms for them, whatever rooms he had, three, four. He opened up all the rooms for them. And the prince and the young princess, they retired to the room. And the window is open, they say, and the, there is a moon shining outside. And the prince being very young, he is hardly 14, 15, and the princess is hardly a 10-year-old girl. So it's, it's a story from the Puranas, it's from the Satya Yuga, maybe. So the prince, he lies down on the bed and he puts his sword on the windowsill. And now the princess, she sees the sword has got a cover with beautiful diamonds and emeralds on it. And they, they shine in the moonlight and she gets enchanted with those and she gets up and she tries to take out the sword from the cover. As she tries it, the sword in her hand, the sword fell, it falls down and it falls on the young prince and the prince dies. And she faints, she gets scared and she faints. Now it's the morning time comes over and everybody is worried outside, the door is not yet open and they try to open it and they break it. They break it and they see the prince, their prince is dead and the 
young princess, she is fainted. She is, and then they think it must be that Mahant, the sage, he must have come through the window because whole night we were at the door and this Mahant, it's his ashram, so he knows which way to go in and which way to go out. And they think the window is open, it must be him. So they catch, they catch the Mahant and they tell the Mahant that, did you kill them, kill him? He says, no, I didn't do anything. I don't know anything about them. But he says, you are the only person here, outsider. It has to be you. And the princess, she's scared. She is now, she's revived and she's full conscious, but she is very scared to say anything. She keeps mum. And then they tell the Mahan that we're going to kill you. But then some of them say, oh no, he's a Brahmana, so better not kill him. But we 